Pass um, the several serves. Well, it'll be 18 to pending, and then we're looking for the attackers, the red team. So we talked to a guy down at the Secret Service and said he could put together a team for us. And he's a friend of the professor's, but... Last month to our Urbana, to the uh, what is it? Information Technologies Institute. So it's a new program they've got down there. And yeah, it was great. Like we had eight teams going. We had the, the red team came in. And Keith Meyer is the guy who'll be DJing tonight. He was a member of our red team before. So I'm looking to talk to him, see if I can get him back out in January. But, How long has it been running? Uh, this would be the second year. It ran last year, and then in January will be the second year. So. Is it Lakeland Community College, Kirtland? Kirtland, Ohio? It's about maybe a half hour east of here. So, and like I said, we're gonna get eight different colleges from the Ohio area together, and then all the states are gonna do it, and then they'll go to the regionals, which will go to San Antonio for the, the nationwide finals. So, and I'm just here looking for some recruits and some hands to help. So. Uh, uh, to participate on one of the teams, you have to be enrolled in six credit hours, and you can't be employed as a security professional. So, but other than that, and it's open to just about anybody. So we've actually got a couple people from the security program, a couple from the forensics program that's supposed to be going on, and it's just a whole mix of talent going in there. We don't teach Solaris at our school, and we're looking for anybody with some Solaris skills. So if you want to enroll in college, we should get you some independent studies or some flexible schedule to bring you in. So, and if you're from another school in Ohio, you're not welcome. <laughs> so, anyone else have any questions? What was the event called? Uh, the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Cyber Defense Competition. I'm sorry? No. No, we, it's all through grants from the, uh, the NSF and Lakeland. They, they got a few other people that are willing to donate. So. Okay. Hey. Okay. So you're supposed to go up to the front because you did a prompt do thing and sign a release form and all this other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. So the question or thought of a speak is about. So yeah. Yes. Yes. You could almost uh, claim that that would be actually kind of funny in a way. So social engineering. I guess the everyone here probably knows the definition. Um, everyone has a different take on it. Um, in my case, just the other day, uh, I was having a discussion with a person that's, that's running, uh, oh, I cannot do this and listen to people at the same time, uh, doing, I work for a college, and they're, uh, we have, she runs a lot of the programs about, uh, I guess high-tech academy type things you'd call it. And she was trying to get a room at this restaurant, and they were like, oh, we don't allow people to come in. So, you know, and reserve a room. We don't take reservations. I went, sure you do. Everybody takes reservations. It's a matter of how you present it. So I walked, so I went over there, made an appointment, found out when the manager was working for the restaurant, and got an unofficial, you can have this room. And it kind of shows that you can use social engineering for something good as opposed to something bad. So I thought this would be an interesting time, because uh, I'm thinking of writing memoirs and commentaries about it. Uh, interesting time to share concepts and thoughts. Uh, friends of mine have thought that you know, social engineering is a lot like uh, improvisation, a little bit like Toastmasters. Anyone here ever been to Toastmasters? Okay, well, basically you go up and during one part of the meeting, 
I'm not real good at this. I say a lot of ands, us, and thes, and waste time like that. But they'll give you a topic, and you have to come up with a two-minute speech about this topic, not knowing maybe anything about it, but fill two minutes of airtime with that topic. And social engineering can, in my view, can be a lot like that. You walk into a situation, you have a plan, you know a lot about what you want to do, what your goals are, but you have no idea what somebody else is going to throw at you that you now have to come up with a response to, um, a response to a challenge. I don't know if anyone saw the movie Serenity. Anyone here see it? The very beginning was a great, a great scene. The guy walked in, the doctor, you know, he's like there under the impression he's allowed to be there. Somebody else comes and says, well, I thought everything was great. Why are you questioning that I'm here? Or that why are you, why are you here since we have okay? And his response, instead of backing down or anything else, was another challenge. And I thought that was really an interesting concept. But if you're in a situation where you need to, uh, to get somewhere, sometimes backing down is good, sometimes it isn't. I just thought that was an interesting uh, example. Uh, some other examples I had were with classes where I've logged teachers in every morning when I go to the class, and I got to be in the class. I thought that was kind of nice. Uh, Hmm? Great, letter grade. I logged him into the system. He didn't know what his user ID or password was and never really wanted to go get it. Yeah. So I logged him in as me. Probably not a good thing to have done, but, you know, a student account is a student account. It's not real, you know. Um, other times I've had where just calling up, uh, for example, Dell technical support. Anyone here ever call up Dell? You have to consist oh. you have to consistently go and uh, answer a thousand questions about yes, the light's flashing, no, the light's not flashing. Um, you know the power supply is dead. They don't want to believe you. You know, at this point, I've gotten to the point where I tell them I've hooked up the power supply to two different power supply checkers, and they both say it's bad. You know, I found that that tends to work. If you say that you're certified and run down a list of a few of the, like A plus, N plus, and whatever else you want to add to the list, they tend to look, you know, they tend to say, okay, and they skip a lot of questions. It's uh, a form of social engineering that's a positive one. Yeah? Uh, you know how Dell will send out technicians to repair a computer? Yeah. If they they I've had that. Um, in my case, um, I don't know how many people dealt with the uh, GX 270s and the bad capacitors, but I, was, I don't really want to go through all the work of having to swap out motherboards and power supplies because they both seem to die. So when I had a lab of uh, about 17 machines, I called them up and uh, asked that they would come out and do it. So they sent me one power supply and one board and a tech. I called them back and then they uh, were going to send out 17 or no, at that point it was 16 power supplies and 16 motherboards for a week or so later. I called them back up and they were only going to send me the power supplies and they, were, they changed it. Then the next day, all that arrived were the motherboards. It was a lot of fun. I hate Dell sometimes. But anybody have any examples of things they've done as social engineering that are interesting to share? Give ideas how you can use this for good or how you can see when you're being engineered. Come on, this is supposed to be interactive. I make ideas for questions. You guys go, you know. Oh, this could be a long 40 minutes, folks. Okay, so the other thing, uh, hopefully the guy will show up. Earlier in the week, I wasn't feeling that, last weekend I wasn't feeling that great, so called up the doctor. He was actually interested in coming because on the weekends and stuff I'm usually wearing a t-shirt of Nauticon or something like that. And I was one day and he asked about it so he said he was going to show up. This was like maybe a couple of months ago. Called him, what was it, Saturday or something? We were talking and I, after he's like, yeah, just call up the nurse, make an appointment, uh, they'll fit you in sometime Monday if there's time. Well, 
I reminded him about the conference. Hey, don't forget about the conference. It's coming up, da, da, da. All of a sudden, he's like, yeah, why don't you just come in at like 8.15 and just tell the girls up front that you talked to me and I'm expecting you. So I did that. Monday morning, 8.15, I'm at the office, got seen just like that. Just because you brought up a relationship. You've, you've made yourself and that person feel warm and comforting. Um, since nobody's going to give and share things. Um, I also was reading a, or listening to an audio book I found online, of course, about sales. And I thought it was really interesting that sales and social engineering are really pretty close. You're trying to sell yourself to this person as their friend, or maybe not their friend, but somebody they want to help to make life easier for them. A bunch of different sales books and things will talk about how you have to find a commonality, put yourself, like if you're a car dealer and you want to sell um, car mats to car dealerships, you want to point out how you're, um, you're part of the car mat sellers for Northeast Ohio because now he says, wow, you sell car mats, but you're in Northeast Ohio only. I'm in Northeast Ohio. So you've made yourself part of the group and part of that person's inner circle because you match in title only, totally a non-related thing, but it's, they've made the association that you're part of their group because they're in that. So naming yourself and that sort of thing is also pretty interesting. How it can, it bond, makes that bond in a relationship that's not normally there. Uh, kind of like this group. A lot of people here have a closeness to other people, not because they know anybody, not because they trust them, because they haven't, in some cases, the people here haven't earned each other's trust, but just because they showed up here, there's an era of trust that you've made with them. Any thoughts, comments, interaction? Are you talking about Dale Carnegie's book? How to Win Friends and Influence People? No, but I have an audio book of that. I love audio books. Um, no, this was the certified, oh, who was this? Certified? Might have been the Certifiable Salesman, but I don't remember. It might have been in that too. Um, I had a job where I dealt with salesmen a lot and they really stressed me out. So I started reading and learning as much as I could about the salesman mentality and philosophies just to survive. But they are interesting though. But I do remember that book. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah? One example I ran into was a good salesman was in a uh, tech equipment show where uh, there was a guy walking, I was walking down the aisle one older salesman calls up to me, hey Jeff, how's things going on down where you're at? It took me a few seconds after I talked to him for a second, I really didn't know him, and he read the name off my tag. There you go. That is true. It's a name tag gives out a lot of information. So does the shirt you're wearing. Um, Kind of almost, if you, if in that case, goes back to your online privacy. I guess you could link this too if you wanted to to make people possibly come up with more commentary. But you look at a profile that you post somewhere on the web, and there's a lot of information that's on that profile. Um, just because you know a person's name, for example, a teacher of mine, I'm always taking classes, he asked what the W in his name meant. Well, I spent three hours searching for what this W means. I have no clue what it, what his, um, the W means, but I know that he knows like a dozen people I know. I have no idea how we've never met because of all the people, the groups, all the circles we're in are very closely knit. I know about his kids going to school, everything just because he posted a ball on his web pages. So if you see a person's name tag, you look it up on the net, you'll have a lot of information about them. Uh, as a person that I, or a video that I saw the other day, this one guy did some really bad things and now is complaining because his, uh, you type in his full name on to Google and what he did that was bad comes up first and, you know, it's hurting him in the job market, but that doesn't necessarily tie in 100% here, but it was still interesting. What do you think about politicians being the ultimate social engineers? They've got to convince everybody to vote for them. Humorously, I keep saying I'm going to put a web page up and have it say vote for Dave. And I figure that um, 
it would be the most humorous thing in the world. I've also thought that a uh, reality TV show where we vote the next person that should be uh, running for president, but I, I, I do agree. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find great humor in the fact that a politician can go up, say one thing this week, next week change their mind 100%, and for some reason we accept it. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. No, people don't question enough. Um, people take a lot of things for granted. Um, just because you put PhD or you know something at the end of your name, you know you're, you're given instant credibility at how many people actually check where your PhD is from if it's an accredited school. Um, nobody background checks like that. Um, it costs money. People don't want to waste the time, the effort. I don't know. Any other thoughts? I'm trying to kill time. What do they do with those? So it seems that most of the things we talked about are really come down to an appeal to authority, whether it's perceived or actual. And that, that that might be a key element to social engineering is making some sort of appeal to authority. For like, I have the certification, or I have a PhD, or I, I have a manager, or whatever. Well, yeah. People want to give over to authority. So if you give them an authority to relinquish to, then they're more likely to go on with whatever program you're setting up. In generality, people are pack animals. <laughs> yeah, people are pack animals. We want to make people happy. We don't always want to be the leader or the follower, um, but we want to make other people happy. So, you know, why am I up here to volunteer? I'm trying to make the con good, trying to make it interesting for people, trying to make people happy, educate. Other people, you know, when you ask a person for help and you're sincere, or sincere, they want to help you, so they try to. They actually said that in one of the little books. Um, but if it's only a, an appeal to authority, I guess we should all be running around in suits, ties, or uh, the police uniform type things, because that makes people respect you more, supposedly. The dark blue is a, you know, supposed to bring authority or something. Yeah, probably. Without being able to just say it. We're authorized. Yeah. Like I did that once in... We don't need no badges. Exactly. I did that once in, in Italy. I was, for a school project, there was this museum that had been outside of Rome that had plaster casts, like all the famous statues of Rome and antiquities from all over the Mediterranean. But sort of in typical Italian fashion, 80% of it was closed for repairs, so you could really only get like two rooms. And we were supposed to do the school report, and so we really just kept asking different people until we found the maintenance man. Every time they would say, no, it's closed, and we said, we have to go there for school, until we found the maintenance man. We said, we have to go there for school, and he was like, oh, okay. And he just took us back there, and it was all, and then any, anytime anybody came through, they said, what are you doing here? And they said, oh, we're fine. And they were like, oh, okay. And granted, that was Italy. But ah, here it would work, too. Yeah. If you, if you have a, yeah, you will. He says, a lot of times you can't just walk into a place and if you act like you have an Arab authority, they won't even question you. Well, what, do you have any comment on next books? Have you read any? I've read part of it. Every time I start reading it, something else I need to work on or read or do something with comes up. So, yeah. Okay. Priority. I had a guy who, I, got a, I knew a guy that the, there was a salesman too, it's interesting, he used to be an engineer and turned into a salesman, scary thought. But he would always, um, when he wanted to get from point A to point B and not be interrupted by people, he would get a wrench or a tool of some sort, put a phone up to his ear, nobody would be on it, he'd hold the wrench and walk wherever it was. If somebody tried to stop him, he'd he just hold up the wrench and act like he was on a mission for whoever was on the phone, and that would be more important, obviously, and he would just keep walking. Uh, I started doing it. It worked. Usually I was on the phone, but the couple of times that I wasn't, you know, it got me through, and I was like, wow, pretty sad. Yeah. So what level two, what did they do stop you? Or you say, I'm authorized, and they say, by who? I mean, what, how do you react to that? 
Each situation is different. That's why I was saying I'm planning actually when I get time to take a class on improvisation just because um, a lot of it's wit. If you're able to give an answer, um, how would you, yeah, how good a bullshitter are you? Would you be willing to say to the guy, you know, you're in a room you're not supposed to be, but what's the situation? Um, are you setting up equipment? Are you just hanging out, chilling? Um, yeah, I mean, you need more background. Or people. Hi, I have a work order. I'm supposed to fix this computer. Where the heck is? Or even go up to the guy. You know, you can. A person walks into a room and you're not supposed to be there. Walking up to somebody saying, "Oh, good, somebody's here to help." You know, hi, can you help me find this room or this spot? I am lost, and I'm supposed to do this. Empathy. Yeah, empathy. Going back to uh, going back to that. I was at places doing rallies and things in my youth, and we were there, and uh, we had like 50 people that had shown up, and we were going to basically have a protest type thing, and we found out that we won before we had won. Yet all these people were there, so you know the, we got stopped. I was sitting there talking to the uh, administrator of this place. We were outside, and a police officer that was there, and all that. And I went, you know what? I don't have a good answer to you of, you know, who has a permit that we ha we needed. So I walked over to the three other guys that were with us that were the administrators and said, "Hi, you guys. I'm being asked currently for the paperwork, and I know we don't have any, and but I'm going to be over here for a few minutes while I come up with another good line before I go back over there, so they feel like I've been talking to you." I went back and said, you know what, they screwed up. All the other people that were supposed to be doing that part of the work didn't get the paperwork filed, didn't check with the people they were supposed to. We were here and just going to have a party outside in celebration of whatever it was. And they didn't want to turn us away because they saw that we were, you know, they felt we were going to do something good for them. And they didn't know about the other parts, so they just let us do it. Just because it looked like Empathy again, yeah. Well, I've also got it too, where I actually got stopped by the local county sheriffs, and and I didn't even know, you know, I, I didn't know the police structure or how they work, but I, the one, it was just he, you can tell it was a young greenhorn sheriff deputy straight off the line, and he stops and he starts being a real dick to me, and I'm like, do you want me to call Sheriff Tim? It's two o'clock in the morning. Do you want me to call Sheriff Tim? I have got his personal home phone number. You want a job tomorrow? And he's like, he's like, oh, oh, you know Sheriff Tim? I'm like, yeah, I know Sheriff Tim. You know, and I, and it was this guy's name that was plastered all over political ads three months <laughs> earlier. I didn't know the guy, but I just bullshitted my way out of the ticket. He's like, oh, 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 okay, sir, have a nice day. And he handed me back my stuff and let me go. There you go. So, you know, sometimes you gotta act like a dick or act like you've got enough authority that you know. I mean, that, that young kid, he probably just got his job. He didn't want to lose his job right away. And I knew the sheriff. You know, he yeah. was just this lowly, brand new deputy. So. But in the same situation, that probably wouldn't have worked with somebody who'd been on the force for 20 years and looked like he was on the force for 20 years. So like you said, it's knowing your situation and knowing the environment in which you're playing in. Also, I think if you don't have the fear of losing, because you know that you know, the worst that's going to happen to you in some cases, you're going to get what you deserved or were going to normally get. So, you know, throwing caution to the wind a little bit in whichever way you decide to play it, it helps. Um, you know, any other thoughts? Come on, somebody who hasn't said something or shared some experience of interest. Wow. 
Yeah, cleaning people is the weakest link in the security chain. I've done that. I actually got fired from a place, and they wouldn't give me my shit back, and they told me to come back Monday morning. I said, fuck that. And I went back Saturday night. I waited until the cleaning crew at like 11, 12 o'clock at night, and I walked in, and I'm like, man, I got this big project to do. Can you get me in? And, it was, and, and nothing against anybody that's Latino, but it was a Hispanic guy. He barely spoke any English. And guess who's got access to the entire goddamn building with the cleaning crew? Or I'm at the cleaning crew doesn't have access to our security areas, so that's yeah, it's a good reason not to let them in. Yeah, that is true. Always be nice to the uh, the secretaries and the uh, cleaning crew. I've been told makes life a lot easier. Um, anybody else have something to share of interest? Okay, or even not interest? Yeah. A good example of social engineering is the uh, Breaking Vegas series on the History Channel. Card sharks. Hmm. Oh yeah. You know, BS your way on a table when they you know, oh, not yet. Yeah. They'll hire uh, strippers to go to the table so that the security guards all focus on them. Meanwhile, they're, they're oh yeah. Or, or they'll hire hire people that. Of, that uh, have been uh, profiled by the casinos as not being cards, not being intelligent enough for card to, for counting cards, but they've you know they've already taught them how to do it, or, or they use the signals. So it was it Ben Mez? This guy's name did the did the book. His name was Ben. The MIT students. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. Versus somebody that was clean cut that walked up to the table that you would you would immediately suspect. Yeah, they exploited profiling, they exploited distraction. So they, you know, stripper. Then they'd have uh, like, uh, you know, older guys from Texas that are loud mouth, very boisterous, have girls on their arms. Hey, I'm just gonna throw some money down. And meanwhile, these guys are doing, you know, doing their signals, and everybody's focused on this guy that's, you know, very uh, outgoing. Yeah, it's very hard to break into Vegas. They got Everywhere, and they all share data. Mm -hmm. So if you get right. profiled one, you're profiled and you break all of them. Right. I, I grew up in Vegas, and my, my mother still worked in the cage. And she told me a story once I was nine. There was a high roller down there, and he was up a couple hundred grand and doing dirt on the table. And they called her up, told her to stand at the end of the table. And within 20 minutes of being there, the guy dropped everything he had won. He was superstitious about a woman. The light always looks like it's about 5 o'clock out. Drinks are watered down. You only get drinks when you're doing good. Otherwise, they leave you alone. You have to, like, almost beg for them. Yeah. Sounds like you've been there before. <laughs> once, actually. Well, yeah, Holding once. Sense. Play correctly. Yeah, you don't get drinks a lot if you're sitting at a um, the nickel slots. Don't do real well. You get a little bit more the higher up the numbers are on them. I don't know. Um, let's see. I'm also supposed to um, let people know anybody here in the Cleveland or this area, Tri C Cuyahoga Community College is also doing a forensics class. Uh, this summer I have some pamphlets. There are some upstairs in the, uh, the free stuff room. So prices are reasonable. Two-day class is going to be like 200 bucks. The one week is, I think, like $700. Um, taught by a guy that's kind of local to this area. Really good guy. Took the class with him. Learned a lot. What's his history? Um, what's his history? 
you know his Glenn. 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 Yeah. He used to be a forensics uh, investigator for the Department of Labor, and uh, he taught, he te he's retired. And he teach, teaches a lot of classes. He's traveled around. He traveled around the country uh, doing forensics uh, classes. He's currently the president of the HTCIA of the United States in the United States at the uh, High Technology Crimes. Investigation. I don't know. He's got a lot of numbers behind him. He knows his stuff. Yeah, he's good. I was. I took a three-hour thing with him and learned a lot. I was real impressed. So I had to officially say that just so that uh, I can check off one of those things at work that I promoted the college at uh, public events. So anybody that's local that's curious, see me or try to find one of the flyers. I have a few in here with me. Any other comments, thoughts? Yeah, I thought that was worthy of bringing up just because I thought it kind of fit. I was wondering if anyone was going to catch that reference or not. And, oh, wow. Well. That's good. At least people are listening then. Um, supposedly, there's those little tickets I can hand out, too. Here. Yeah, I just got to find them. I don't know. Did I leave them up there? Or, oh, he has. Oh, that, there should be some over there. I thought I did. But there should be some interesting thoughts that people have. A How about some good movies on social engineering? I just, oh. I, I just saw Catch Me If You Can. Was that? Yeah. And at first, I, I, I originally wasn't going to see it. I, you know, I didn't that was the airplane guy, right? Yeah. Doing the airplane? That yeah, was a good movie. That was really good for social engineering. The other one I thought was really interesting is uh, Bruce Willis and Jack. Is it Jackal? The Jackal? I think oh, that was old. Yeah, it's not a good movie. But I was wondering if anybody else had any movies. Flash? Yeah. What's that? Flash. Chevy Chase. Yeah, that's right. That's old. Just charges to the Underhills. Oh, let's see. You, you ask questions. Who else asks questions? There you go. I, I guess that's a good answer. Who else asked? You did. You know. There you go. Susan. Yeah, go ahead. I keep getting phone calls from, I guess my house number must be really close to some government uh, help desk number. And uh, I just keep wanting to say, yeah, I can do that. What's your user ID? Um, you know, what's your current password? And then, okay, don't forget, change it at the end of today. And if I could ever figure out exactly where they work, you know, I'd have a password that probably works for the rest of the day. The trick to that is, hmm? you can do that. It's easy to say, well, what division are you in? Yeah. Well, what screen address is that? What's I get oh, answering well, machine. That division. Yeah. Okay, hold on one minute. I haven't been the one that's answered the phone and been lucky no, enough to actually do that. You just got to deal with bullshit. I mean, you can get anything out of anybody. That is true. I would, if, if I answered the phone and that was when that happened, I would be so happy because I would probably do it just for the fun of it. But, you know. 
not usually lucky enough to get the phone. But um, yeah, if you do add the uh, comment, I noticed where I work, I don't know about you guys, but um, people want to seem to give me their password. They can have you know signs right above their desk saying, don't give out passwords. And they'll be like, here, you want my password so you can log in. Um, and I find that to be terrible. But you know, you could always, if, as long as you tell a person, don't forget to change it when I'm done, you know, chances are, A, they won't. But you'd still have a valid password till the end of the day, even if you did that over the phone, which is kind of scary and sad just because of human nature. Or the mouse pad. Mouse pad. It's, amazing, you know. it, it's kind of sad. Yes, it is. Because they're cat. They don't understand. So, yeah. Well, I, I work. I work in the um, ISP industry and uh, doing system administration mostly. Is what I do. So I deal a lot with you know telcos calling in problems and stuff, and trying to deal with uh, net, you know level one trying to get stuff done. Well, what I found is that um, they oftentimes will give you like phone numbers directly to the central offices, and uh, you know by accident, like they meant for you to call, or when somebody calls you from the central office and you get off the caller ID. So I just keep a list of all like the central office phone numbers, and so oftentimes I can call right in to the central office, and they don't ask for any ticket ID or anything. They just go and check. Yeah, I'm because that's all security through security. They expect that if you yeah. already know the number, that you must be high enough on the food chain. That you don't yeah, you can even get you can even get them to tap lines because they can come in. You know, like channel, you know, they got channelized T ones coming through or whatever. They can come if that's like a PRI. They they'll come right on and they, they'll like you can hear them listening to the audio on each channel. So you can be like, hey, can you check this channel? So if you knew a certain T one that you were you wanted to get information from, you call right in and they can happen because they think you're looking for something you're calling for. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I was had just the ability to do it from the PBX where I was at when I did a lot of phone work. But any other thoughts, comments? I still got to use up more of these tickets. I'm not allowed to keep them. What are the tickets for? The tickets are for, yeah, that's right. We've got a sponsor raffle up there. Yeah. There's a bunch of tubes. Yeah, there's a bunch of tubes. You pick which raffle they're supposed to label, I think, what prize is for which tube. So if there's a prize that you want, you would put your ticket in that particular tube for that prize. So if there's something cool, you have a chance of winning what you want, not a random thing. So if you want the... Know what sounds like a glorified chaining Yes. I think they're supposed to... Yeah, you put one side. I would imagine that the... Uh, Keep this coupon is the one that you keep. I, I could be wrong. This may be done in reverse, but you know. Yeah, it doesn't say who should keep it. That is true. Same numbers on both of them. I'm guessing it doesn't actually matter. Unless you, have, unless you fill out your information on the back of the one labeled ticket. Yeah, that's for the same people who want to eat the silica packets on the bottom of the medicine. <laughs> Do not eat this packet. You know some dumbass. Um, <laughs> ben and, or who was it? There was a, Penn and Teller had a book of uh, bad practical jokes and they had one of those unopenable packets and they got sued because somebody, I guess, took a pair of scissors or something, cut it open and ate it. I remember that. I don't know. Yeah. Well, hey, what about those combs? You can break the unbreakable ones. But speaking of which, who here knows anything about the Dura book? Did you for our regular tough book? You know, about 1500. Yeah, but the military uses them, don't they? No, they use the tough books for tennis. Tough books for the micro center over over Mayfield Heights here. They've got a Dura book. It's the same magnesium case. The specs are similar, but it's about a thousand dollars less. Talk with uh, Amish One. He loves the tough books. Uh, he's doing the intro to photography. 
Um, or the hmm? No, no, no. I thought that was. Uh, Oh, they're both doing it? Yeah. Oh, okay. You're right. They, he does. Myself does have one, doesn't he? Yeah. Because it's a real tiny little screen. Yeah. So. Well, I have to get rid of these. So, sir, who's leaving, would you like one of these since you did actually provide stuff and commentary? How can you turn down free crap? Get up there. Yeah, how can you turn down a chance at free stuff? And actually, I did see some of the prizes. They look pretty good this year. A lot of. Uh, you said one or more than one? Because technically there are two pieces of paper, and how would we know which one you're going to keep? Well, that's why I said one. Uh, okay, come on. Three different people who haven't talked yet. Say something. Something does count. That's pretty pathetic if you're going to use that as a claim. Do we have to give out all of these, or are we allowed to keep some? Okay, I'll give that. Can you add? The guy in the orange shirt? The guy in the orange shirt? The red face? Yeah, he looks like he needs a comment. I need a comment. Yeah, come on, step on the blue plate, son. Did you get one? You I got one. Okay. Yeah. I, I understand, right, but give me the ticket first. <laughs> that would be a social engineering type of uh, attack that we're not allowed to do or be receptible to. I have a good story. It just happened. Okay. I just told you that I had a good story if you'd give me a ticket, and it didn't work. You're right. So do you have another good story? Uh, it's good enough for me. Yeah, only when it doesn't count. But he'll give me a good one when I give him the ticket. I'm, I'm, I'm counting on that. Did I just rip this the wrong way? No. I have a new story now. It worked. That's funny. Anybody else? Yes. Back in my teen years, when of course my primary current was alcohol, uh, on multiple occasions uh, I would walk into stores and, and buy booze of one sort or another and get through, even though I was very obvious in her age. In one case, a woman charged me, I gave her my license, she looked at it, gave it back, and handed it over. She just couldn't do date math, I guess, but well, she just, you know, the act of doing was enough to convince her. Wow. Is it that people are too lazy to do the math, and if you just if you have the license, even if it's a fake one, and they don't look at it real quick, they'll think that, oh, you don't feel enough, you have a license. Well, it was a million. On the very same day, I then went to smoke my booze into the theater, and it wasn't that because we thought it was a rage. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. I guess you're out six minutes early. Yay! Yay! I gave him credit for the high. He spoke up first. It seemed fair. <laughs> Anybody else want to just donate information or commentary without the need for something? We need to here next year. He costs a lot of money right now. I think oh, he. Really? Anybody know how much he's asking? He's too much. He's overpriced. Okay, well, uh, that Thank should do it. Thanks. Thank you. Yay! Time here on the Raver's Edge. We've been doing music today. I know we've been having a good time listening to it. So was that We've been listening to no, no, a live did, uh, 43 minutes of film, right? Awesome. Guy, wow. That's there, not, that's a lot of work, actually. Hooked up to his laptop, he was able to live shots. It's just all live breaks here on the Raver's Edge.